Welcome, everyone. I do want to let you all know we are recording today's presentation and discussion. Um, I'm Craig Benjamin, the Director of Conservation for the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, and thank you all for joining us today for the first of our three-part 40th anniversary Protect What You Love webinars. Today's presentation features GYC's Senior Wildlife Associate, Shana Dremal, who will talk with us about 40 years GYC's legacy of giving Yellowstone bison room to roam. And we have a lot of folks joining us from all across the country and potentially around the world today. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment, using the chat feature, say hello, let us know where you're zooming in from, that would be fantastic. And just to outline how today's presentation will go, the format will include Shana's presentation, which is jam-packed with information about bison and will take approximately 40 minutes. And then we'll have another approximately 15 minutes for questions and discussion. And please post any questions that you have in the chat and I will moderate the chat. And once Shana finishes her presentation, we will get to all of those questions. And before we begin, I would like to formally recognize that we are presenting from the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And long before the arrival of Europeans and the beginning of the Western Conservation Movement, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem was stewarded by Indigenous people who viewed its lands, waters, and wildlife as sacred. And the Indigenous way of caring for land acknowledges its life-giving energy is centered on reciprocity, and uses traditional ecological knowledge to keep the ecosystem in balance. And today, more than 30 tribes, including the Absolute, Crow, Cheyenne, Blackfeet, Shoshone, Bannock, Arapaho, and other indigenous peoples are keepers of this knowledge and retain deep connections to this remarkable place. The forced removal of indigenous peoples from places like Yellowstone and the loss of indigenous land stewardship practices that resulted and the continued exclusion of native voices from the Western conservation movement are realities we must acknowledge and confront. Recognizing and reinstituting indigenous values, beliefs, and practices is a vital step in restoring the cultural and ecological integrity of this region. The Greater Yellowstone Coalition is committed to identifying and fulfilling our role in advancing this paradigm shift. So today, we'll hear from Shana Drimmel about our work over the years to give Yellowstone bison more room to roam. Shana has been involved with many of our wildlife programs while at GYC, and more recently has led our bison conservation program. For eight years now, she has been a champion for this iconic and sacred species. And with that, Shana, please take it away. All right, thanks, Craig. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate 40 years of conservation work in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Specifically today, as Craig mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about our legacy of giving Yellowstone bison room to roam. I'm gonna start us off with a little bit of general background information about bison and their history for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the issue. Then I will get into an overview of our bison work over the last 40 years, what we're doing now and where we're going in the future. And then at the end, there should be uh, some time for questions and discussion. So a quick little intro about me and how I got here. As Craig mentioned, I came to GYC just over eight years ago. Um, before that, I spent more than a decade working as a wildlife researcher with various agencies and institutions in Yellowstone, the Northern Rocky Mountains, Alaska, and Africa, um, studying some of our most iconic and controversial species, uh, including bison. I've been working on bison in some capacity for about two decades now. And I really first fell in love with them while spending uh, many winters in and around them doing field research in Yellowstone in the early 2000s. So a component of this research um, as a biologist was studying bison movements and habitat use, as well as predator-prey interactions between wolves, um, grizzly bears, elk, and bison. 
And honestly, Bison are just super cool. Um, they are true places in relics. They're these massive, beautiful uh, creatures, perfectly adapted to these harsh environmental conditions. And I was just immediately struck by their resilience and their toughness that is equally matched by their loyalty and gentleness, especially in the mothers with their calves. You know, I saw them endure and survive the harshest winter conditions and predatory attacks. And as a species, they have survived ongoing mistreatment, mass slaughter and near extinction at the hands of humans. So I realized that this species has such an important role here beyond their cultural importance to the landscape as ecosystem engineers, but their cultural and spiritual significance is unparalleled. And their presence, I believe, is something that we can all really benefit from. So I wanted to do more to ensure their continued existence and work towards promoting their restoration on a broader scale, both within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and beyond. So that is what I've been doing at GYC for the last eight years. Um, but before I talk about uh, this work, I thought I would touch on GYC's milestone anniversary. So for decades, we have worked uh, with people to protect the lands, waters, and wildlife of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and we are super excited about the next 40. Um, our work and organization has grown immensely since our inception. Um, we are super proud of our successes, and really thanks to so many of you who have helped us achieve so many significant milestones over the years. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, GYC's story began in the early 80s. Our founders recognized that an organization was needed to advocate for this uh, remarkable region that is the GYE. They knew that in order to protect the world's first national park and the iconic Yellowstone grizzly bear on the brink of extinction, someone had to step in and take action to protect the entire ecosystem. Just a few years later in 1983, a couple dozen smart and dedicated conservationists, activists, scientists, and others gathered together at Mammoth in the park and soon thereafter, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition was formed. Now, in the early days, our work focused primarily on grizzly bear conservation, and you will learn much more about that at the upcoming webinar. Just a few years later, we were working on land trades to limit development, uh, helping to reintroduce wolves into Yellowstone, halting the New World Mine, and eventually improving conservation outcomes for Yellowstone bison. So a little bit about the American Plains bison, scientifically known as bison, 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 also referred to as buffalo by many indigenous people. Um, at UIC, we use both buffalo and bison somewhat interchangeably. Um, bison are the largest land dwelling mammal in North America. In fact, males can weigh up to 2000 pounds and females up to about 1100 pounds. Um, both males and females have these large protruding shoulder humps and shaggy brown fur and their shoulder and neck muscles allow bison to swing their heads back and forth uh, to clear snow as they forage for grass and sedges and other plants during the winter months. They are super fast and agile and can run up to 35 miles per hour as well as jump up to five feet in the air. So it's pretty impressive. <laughs> uh, females birth one cinnamon calf per year and they are just the cutest things. If you haven't seen one in person, you really should. Um, and these adorable calves begin to turn brown after about two and a half months and remain with their mothers for about a year. As a species, plains bison were also once the most abundant land mammal in North America and perhaps the world. In fact, only 200 years ago, there was an estimated 30 to 60 million plains bison that roamed the grasslands and shrub steps from Mexico to central Canada. They were an ecological keystone species and considered ecosystem engineers for grassland ecosystems, playing a critical role on the landscape, their grazing, movements, and behavior literally shaped the physical environment, creating new habitat for a plethora of species, including amphibians and birds, promoting plant species diversity, health, and vitality. And one cannot overstate their cultural significance as well and the role that they played for millennia for the many Native American tribes that once roamed this, con this continent. Um, in fact, it's been said that no other wildlife species has had as much impact on humans and the ecosystems that they occupy than bison. However, as Europeans settled the West in the 1800s, the federal government began a campaign to remove Native American tribes from the landscape by taking away their main food source, bison. And by 1902, after years of intensive market hunting and commercial slaughter, 
Only 23 wild bison remained and they had found refuge in the high elevation interior of Yellowstone National Park. At about the same time, Teddy Roosevelt traveled to the Dakota Territory to hunt bison. And after spending a few years in the West, he returned to New York with a new outlook on life and he paved the way for the conservation movement and in 1905 formed the American Bison Society with William Hornaday to save the disappearing bison. And since the late 19th century, the Department of Interior has been the primary national conservation steward of bison. Now today there are somewhere around 450,000 bison across North America. However, the vast majority are raised in confinement for meat. They're privately owned, fenced, and for all intents and purposes considered domesticated livestock. Most um, also have some level of cattle gene and aggression, meaning somewhere along the way they have been bred with cattle. So they no longer represent the valuable genetics of American Plains bison that once roamed most of North America. Furthermore, remaining bison only occupy a very small fraction of their former range, in fact, less than 1% by some estimates, and most tribal and ancestral lands remain void of bison. The Department of Interior currently manages about 11,000 bison in 19 public conservation herds across 12 states. However, most of these animals are segregated into small isolated herds with just a few hundred animals, leaving them prone to inbreeding and other genetic issues uh, further threatening loss of genetic diversity. Uh, the one exception, however, is Yellowstone's iconic bison herd. <clears throat> so today there are around 6,000 bison in Yellowstone, which not only makes them the largest population of free roaming plains bison, they're also considered the last remaining truly wild herd that is ecologically viable, genetically valuable, um, large and wide ranging. They descended from the last wild herd and Yellowstone is the only place in the US where these bison have continuously lived since prehistoric times. Um, these bison are a reservoir of some of the most valuable genetics for the long-term conservation of the species. So not only are they the most genetically pure herd of any remaining conservation herd in existence, they're still exposed to a whole host of natural selection factors such as predation, harsh climatic and environmental conditions, um, and given their large numbers have therefore retained much of their genetic diversity and many of the adaptations that have been lost in other more domesticated and or smaller herds throughout the country. And finally, this herd has unparalleled significance to many Native American tribes who see Yellowstone bison as uniquely linked to their ancestral descendants. And in fact, as this map here shows, uh, there are 49 tribes that have direct cultural and ancestral ties to Yellowstone bison and the lands and resources of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So how do we go from 23 to 6,000 Yellowstone bison? Yellowstone National Park played a key role in the conservation of wild bison in North America. And those last remaining 23 bison back in 1902 became significant to saving our nation's ecologically viable and genetically viable American Plains bison from extinction. So in one of the first efforts to preserve a wildlife species through protection and stewardship, Yellowstone set out to recover the last remaining wild bison population. And in 1902, they purchased 21 bison from private owners 18 from the Pablo Allard herd in Northwest Montana and three bulls uh, that came from, Mex or, sorry, from Texas and raised them in Mammoth and then later at the historic Buffalo Ranch in the Lamar Valley. Eventually these animals began to mix with the park's free roaming population and by 1954, the numbers had grown to roughly 1300 animals. So for a number of years, the park carefully managed the population through culling for fear that bison and elk would overgraze the park until about 1968 when the park shifted to natural regulation or ecological management and a moratorium on culling was implemented. And bison are a very prolific species. So it was soon after this that the population began to grow exponentially. Um, as you can see here on this graph, that curve starts to shoot upward around 1970. No doubt the story of bison in Yellowstone National Park is a conservation success story and that we've gone from 23 wild bison to now over 6,000 in the park today, the largest free roaming herd of plains bison in existence. However, this story has been fraught with controversy. Um, bison are naturally migratory species and much of their natural winter range 
exists in the lower elevation valley bottom areas outside of Yellowstone National Park, as it does for many other migrating ungulate species. As numbers steadily increased over the last century, bison began resuming their natural migratory patterns to try and access these winter ranges that are north and west of the park, putting them at the center of an intense and ongoing wildlife controversy. The dotted line on this map represents what they believe to be the pre-settlement distribution of bison in this area, which extended well beyond the park to include these winter habitat areas. As they left the park, bison encountered a changed world, however, um, a landscape that had become a maze of development, fenced pastures, houses and highways, and of course, livestock. And large groups of 1,000 to 2,000 pound animals searching for food can create challenges for people sharing that landscape, both in terms of human safety and because bison want to eat the same grass that ranchers grow to feed their livestock. To further complicate things, bison and elk in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem carry brucellosis. Um, this is a European livestock disease that was introduced into the park in the early 1900s by dairy cows. Um, this disease can be transmitted to livestock and induce abortions or stillbirths in infected animals and can have an economic impact on ranchers because it can affect the reproductive rate and marketability of their animals. Now, after years of intense efforts, it has been largely eradicated in Yellowstone, um, sorry, in livestock throughout the country. However, there still exists uh, this reservoir in greater Yellowstone wildlife. So fears that wild bison leaving the park will come into contact with livestock on the landscape in Montana and transmit the disease to these animals, in addition to, and perhaps even more so, competition for grass, drives the heavy-handed management of Yellowstone bison today, even though there has never been a documented case of a wild bison transmitting brucellosis to livestock on the landscape, and all transmission events have been linked back to elk. Nevertheless, it's due to these fears and lack of tolerance by the livestock community in Montana <clears throat> uh, that any bison attempting to leave the park throughout the 1980s and 90s were immediately shot and killed. As the population continued to grow and more bison attempted to leave the park, uh, controlling their, their dispersal through culling became difficult. And the state of Montana sued Yellowstone National Park in the mid 90s for not controlling their bison from leaving the park. As part of the court mediated settlement, the Interagency Bison Management Plan or IBMP was born and first implemented in 2000. The intent of the IBMP is to drastically limit Yellowstone bison numbers well below estimated carrying capacity for the park, as well as their access to lands outside the park in order to maintain that spatial separation with cattle to protect the livestock industry. And to accomplish this, Yellowstone National Park has been forced to capture and send to slaughter many hundreds of bison that leave the park every year, in addition to hazing of bison back into the park and limited state and tribal hunting that takes place just beyond the park border. And since 2000, more than 6,000 Yellowstone bison have been sent to slaughter. So we believe our most ecologically and culturally significant wild bison herd deserves better. So our work has really focused on charting a new course for Yellowstone bison. And in the early years, we were primarily focused on securing room to roam for bison outside Yellowstone so they could be allowed to migrate like other migratory wildlife species and manage more like wildlife with habitat needs that extend far beyond the park boundary. And ultimately, so they could restore lost ecosystem function across the greater Yellowstone landscape and no longer manage through mass slaughter and hazing. Now, in recent years, we've added an additional broader focus, and that is we want to see wild bison and ideally Yellowstone bison restored to tribal and public ancestral lands across North America. In the early days, much of GYC's bison conservation work centered on public outreach and advocacy work to ultimately change the laws and policies that limited bison access to important winter and spring habitat outside the park. Um, we also developed programs and partnerships geared toward building social tolerance for bison when they roamed beyond the park borders. Inside the park, we worked to ensure bison management was based on the best available science. So for example, this included advocating for changes in snowmobile regulations that reduced impacts on wildlife, including bison and improved air quality. As we moved into the 2000s, we continued to focus on securing habitat for bison to use outside Yellowstone 
by really promoting social tolerance for and reducing the potential for conflicts with wild bison on the landscape outside of the park. And this included grazing allotment buyouts um, and, and uh, land leases to remove potential cattle conflicts from the landscape. Uh, for example, in 2008, GYC and our conservation partners worked with the National Park Service and Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks to purchase a 30 year uh, lease on a large section of land owned by the Royal Teton Ranch in the Gardner Basin. And as part of this deal, the ranch agreed to retire cattle grazing on their property and allow bison to move through their lands so that they could access an additional 75,000 acres of public land on the other side. In addition, we helped to retire the last remaining cattle allotments in the Upper Gallatin in 2010 and the last allotment remaining in the Gardner Basin. And all of these are shown here in red on this map. Um, and as a result, very few cattle conflicts remain now in these areas north and west of the park. Um, in addition, in 2011, we started the Yellowstone Bison Coexistence Program. This is a collaborative effort between GYC and our conservation partners in collaboration with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, um, which aims to mitigate potential conflicts and concerns over wild bison roaming beyond the park by offering financial and technical assistance to landowners to build bison exclusion fences to protect private property and keep bison out of potential conflict areas. The program is still ongoing. Uh, last year, we completed our 57th project and it continues to be a really successful, well-supported program that has helped to foster social tolerance for wild bison in communities surrounding the park. So again, remember that in the 80s and 90s, any bison attempting to leave the park um, and crossing that purple line were immediately shot and killed. All of our conflict reduction uh, work and social tolerance work really helped to prime the landscape for the return of wild bison and gain the political support that we could then use to advocate for policy changes to establish and then incrementally expand what are called bison tolerance areas where bison are allowed to go outside of the park. The first expansion was in the year 2000, establishing a small tolerance area just north of Gardner that's shown there in yellow, and another west of the park as shown there in pink, both of which were seasonal tolerance areas. So what that means is that bison were hazed back into the park in the late spring uh, to avoid coming into contact with cattle on the landscape. The second expansion was in 2008 with the Royal Teton Ranch deal. Um, so you can see this small sliver of land right here that was added um, after that deal went through and that opened up another 75,000 acres. Another in 2012, this is this larger um, yellow tolerance area here after all the Northern cattle allotments were retired. Now this Northern tolerance area totaled 104,000 acres of seasonal habitat on the North side. And then the most recent habitat expansion and significant uh, probably expansion that took place was in 2016. And this included 255,000 acres of year round habitat on the west side. That's that area shown there in purple. And then the entire Northern tolerance area um, came year round for bulls at this time as well. So because of all this work in the last 23 plus years, we, you know, we went from zero tolerance for now, you know, to now more than 375,000 acres of habitat outside Yellowstone where these bison are now allowed to roam to access important winter habitat and spring calving grounds. Most of this is year round habitat. So this has basically ended the hazing of bison. While our conflict work is ongoing, uh, more recently we have shifted our focus toward restoring bison to these tolerance areas because unfortunately, as this map on the left shows, uh, much of these new areas remain void of bison. The darker green area shows the existing tolerance areas and the red or pinkish uh, color is their current distribution. Um, however, in recent years, their distribution um, and the northern side is actually much more confined to the park um, due to recent increases in hunting pressure. Uh, we know, however, that their pre-settlement distribution probably looks something more like the map um, on the right there as shown by that dotted line, which significantly overlapped those tolerance areas. So we are working to partner with the Custer Gallatin National Forest on some habitat improvement projects to support bison dispersal uh, throughout these tolerance areas um, following direction from the new forest plan for which we fought really hard and we're pretty successful at getting some new forest plan direction that supports 
bison year-round use of and broad distribution throughout these existing tolerance areas through habitat improvement projects and other plan direction. In addition, we're working to address um, the other primary barriers to bison dispersing farther out in the landscape, and that's uh, hunting at the park boundary and current management actions, namely trapping bison near the boundary for slaughter to meet state-imposed IBMP population objectives. Now, hunting is a super complex issue, and we could spend the whole hour talking about it, but in short, most bison attempt to migrate out of the park through a small bottleneck area in the Gardner Basin which is a natural corridor area for many migrating ungulate species. Um, this area is called Beatty Gulch there, as shown on that map. <clears throat> Habitat constraints and a patchwork of public lands um, has resulted in many of the eight treaty tribes that now come to the area to hunt, to congregate on these small patches of land near the valley where most bison leave the park and where there's the most hunting opportunity naturally. However, this, along with trapping bison for slaughter near the boundary in the same general area, has resulted in a pretty solid barrier that in most winters, very few bison grew. We have been making some slow progress with our state wildlife agency and some of the tribes to consider implementing some hunt closures and restrictions to help promote bison dispersal farther into tolerance areas. Um, in addition, we've long been advocating for a change in bison management you know, namely the use of trapping and slaughter at the boundary to keep um, bison numbers low and prevent dispersal into Montana. And we have an important opportunity coming up to advocate uh, for a change to this through policy changes as Yellowstone recently began the process to write a new bison management plan, which I am gonna talk about um, here in uh, more detail shortly. First, I want to talk about another very important area of our work in recent years. So we've made a lot of great progress uh, towards securing room to roam for bison outside Yellowstone and are steadily working towards restoring bison to these areas. However, many hundreds of bison are still being sent to slaughter every year, um, typically about 500 in most years, to meet the current IBMP population objective and to stabilize the population, which is growing exponentially without human intervention. So over the last several years, we and our conservation and tribal partners working with federal and state agencies with Yellowstone's leadership um, worked to develop and more recently expand the Yellowstone Bison Conservation Transfer Program as a way to rehome disease-free Yellowstone bison to tribal lands through a multi-step, multi-year quarantine process. This not only serves as an alternative to shipping brucellosis free Yellowstone bison to slaughter to manage their numbers, it supports the culture, the economy, nutrition, and food sovereignty of Native Americans. It helps preserve that unique Yellowstone bison genome. And ultimately, it will contribute to the conservation and restoration of the species to portions of its native range on public and tribal lands across North America. Now, because 40 to 60 percent of these bison carry brucellosis, they cannot simply be rehomed like with other uh, bison herds unless they have first been just, uh, certified disease free through this multi step quarantine and testing process, um, which currently takes between two to four years to complete, depending on age and sex. However, for the first several years of this program, limited capacity at the Yellowstone quarantine facility significantly limited the number of bison that could enter the program. And many hundreds of disease-free bison were still being sent to slaughter that could otherwise have been diverted and transferred elsewhere. So in 2021, GYC partnered with Yellowstone National Park and Yellowstone Forever to raise $1 million to almost triple the capacity of Yellowstone's quarantine facility so that more bison could be diverted from slaughter and rehomed on tribal lands. The expansion was completed last summer, um, increasing capacity from entering on average about 80 animals to about 250 animals over three-year intervals and reducing the number of quarantine eligible bison that are sent to slaughter due to capacity issues from about 70% down closer to 20%. Since the program began in 2018, just under 300 bison have completed the program, been certified brucellosis free and transferred onto the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, and then eventually on to now 20 different tribes across nine states. Um, this map shows some of those different places that Yellowstone bison have gone now through this program. 
And the picture there in the middle, sorry, it's a little bit pixelated. Um, it's a picture of three Yellowstone bulls and their custom made crates being FedEx to Kodiak Island, Alaska to augment an existing herd there. They made the journey by truck, by plane, and eventually by boat. So it was quite the journey. Now, I wanna share with you a very special experience. Um, this past January, the, the largest bison transfer to date took place um, with 112 Yellowstone bison being sent to Fort Peck Indian Reservation, including seven bulls, 53 cows, and 52 calves. Um, I had the incredible opportunity to see and experience the entire process from loading the bison into their trailers in Yellowstone to watching a reunited herd of cows and calves run off into the sunrise the next morning as they were released onto the super wild and expansive landscape at the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. And this here is a, a short little video that I took with my iPhone standing out in that pasture as they were being released. And so I want to share with you all. This was um, easily one of the most special and rewarding experiences I've had in my professional career. Um, you know, to, to be there and to see these cows and calves come running out as they were released, I could I could honestly like see and feel their gratitude. Like they knew and understood that they, you know, were some of the lucky ones who got a second chance and a happy ending. And it was also incredible to hear firsthand from tribal members while there about how the bison at Fort Peck have brought meaning, connection education, cultural revitalization, economic benefits and healing to the people and communities there. And just their immense gratitude for these bison. Um, no doubt the impact that these bison will have on the land and the people there will reverberate for generations. And it just further solidified the importance and absolute necessity of what we're trying to accomplish with this program. So of, of course, we don't want to stop there. Um, we want to further expand this program by working to develop one or more additional facilities within the region so that eventually 100% of captured eligible bison can be rehomed and diverted from slaughter and to create sort of a steady pipeline of brucellosis free Yellowstone bison available for restoration efforts on tribal and public ancestral lands across North America. Um, we're currently looking to identify some potential locations for this, and we're also making headway on improving the efficiency of the quarantine process by 
pushing the Department of Agriculture to update their testing and quarantine timelines so that they're consistent with the latest science and data that supports this. Um, this could significantly reduce the amount of time it takes for bison to go through this process so that ultimately more bison can enter and move through the program more quickly, which of course means more bison diverted from slaughter and rehomed to tribes. Um, there will be a public process with an opportunity for you and the public to weigh in on this starting soon, sometime in the next month or two. So please stay in touch if you would like to help out with that. I want to uh, briefly talk about some of our current on the Wind River Indian Reservation as part of GYC's new Wind River Water and Buffalo Alliance, um, led by GYC's Wes Martell, a former Eastern Shoshone business councilman, and as part of the National Wildlife Federation's Wind River Tribal Buffalo Initiative. And the primary goals of this alliance um, is to work in partnership with the Eastern Shoshone and the Northern Arapaho tribes and NWF in restoring the Big Wind River and a wild buffalo herd of substantial size on the reservation. Um, currently, the two tribes collectively have about 100 bison held on a few hundred acres. The goal is to expand this significantly, um, specifically to secure 100,000 acres through various land acquisition and purchases, um, repatriation and grazing allotment leases, um, eventually with 1,000 wild buffalo on it to support indigenous wildlife conservation, tribal food sovereignty, and supporting and connecting indigenous culture for both elders and the youth to the restoration of the river and the return of buffalo to the reservation. So I wanna come back to Yellowstone's new bison management planning process and EIS that I mentioned earlier because this is an important opportunity to update and shift how these bison are managed that reflects new information, changed circumstances and regulations, and really significant progress made since the IBMP was finalized in 2000, much of which I just talked about. And this is something that we will continue to focus on for the foreseeable future throughout this process. Ultimately, we see this as a, a timely and much needed opportunity to shift away from the ship to slaughter model of population management to one that is really focused on tribal partnership and cooperation and the conservation and restoration of this iconic bison herd. Specifically, this is an opportunity for Yellowstone con to consider a management plan that will support these bison as migratory wildlife and promote dispersal onto the larger GYE landscape where they are allowed. Um, one that moves away from managing towards a set population target and instead manages numbers based on new carrying capacity estimates for the park and in response to real conflicts and real impacts on the ground outside the park. And one that will allow for the gradual phase out of slaughter and instead prioritize tribal treaty hunting and further expansion of the bison conservation transfer program to manage bison numbers. And then of course, um, one that will support close collaboration and partnership with the tribes to manage bison numbers together and in such a way that supports treaty rights and access to bison and improved bison dispersal and hunting outside the park. Despite um, continued opposition from the state of Montana and current administration wanting the population um, to, to be reduced to 3000 bison in the park, um, Yellowstone is holding strong, and in fact, they made the monumental announcement this past fall that their intent going forward is to move away from bison management focused on population reduction and slaughter toward a management regime that prioritizes rehoming bison to tribal lands and providing tribal treaty hunting opportunities outside the park. So specifically, they made the decision that they will no longer manage bison numbers to reach state imposed uh, politically driven population objectives and barring any significant conflicts, um, the park will primarily capture bison for the purpose of entering bison into the transfer program. And honestly, this signifies a drastic departure um, away from how these bison have been managed over the last two decades and represents what we have long been advocating for, which is a shift away from ship, uh, shift, uh, ship to slaughter and, and this focus on population reduction to one focus really on tribal partnership and cooperation and the conservation and restoration of this iconic bison herd. Now the start, uh, the park started implementing this shift this past winter by taking a very light approach to trapping bison um, and doing so for the purpose of entering bison into the quarantine program. 
and they um, allowed most bison through to leave the park. And while this is in part due to heavy snowback, there have been record numbers of bison outside the park this winter. Um, in fact, the entire uh, northern bison herd um, has been outside of the park in the Gardner Basin, including some making their way um, to the far end of that tolerance area, which we have not seen in many years. Um, in addition to record numbers of tribal and state hunter harvest on the landscape. We are super hopeful that this reflects um, what we'll see in a progressive range of alternatives in the upcoming um, EIS process for a new Yellowstone Bison Management Plan. So we would encourage all of you to stay tuned and please keep in touch and help us weigh in on this process this coming spring. And that should be out for public comment probably in the next month or two. I also want to quickly mention some exciting progress that's being made to reintroduce a wild bison herd on the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge in Northeast Montana. After more than a decade of conversations and work on the part of federal state agencies, um, NGOs and tribes, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service will soon be moving forward with a formal analysis and public comment period to look at restoring bison to a portion of their refuge. Um, this is an exciting opportunity to not only support the restoration of a wild bison herd on public lands in Montana, but it also will be an opportunity to consider and support a public intertribal bison herd potentially co-managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service and several Montana tribes, in addition to an opportunity to potentially use disease-free Yellowstone bison for this effort. So again, stay tuned for this exciting opportunity and a chance to weigh in on this as well in the next coming month or two. Lastly, um, in recent years, we have prioritized and made a commitment to supporting tribal interests, rights, and inclusion in the stewardship and management of our public lands and wildlife, including buffalo. Returning buffalo to indigenous cultural lands on reservations and to federal public lands represents much needed hope and healing peoples. I and mean, it also has, you know, significant implications for the restoration and revitalization of tribal sovereignty, culture, food security, traditional ecological knowledge, health, and just so much more. So as part of this effort, we hosted a three-day intertribal gathering on the Wind River uh, Reservation last year with tribes and tribal leaders, indigenous activists, federal agencies, and nonprofits um, to create a space to really elevate indigenous voices, a space for productive, actionable conversations about the future of indigenous inclusion in the stewardship and management of public lands and wildlife, and really opening the door for new collaborations and partnerships to support tribal interests and rights. And of course, one of the focal topics of this event was the restoration of Buffalo and Yellowstone and beyond. <clears throat> We've also hosted Buffalo Treaty Signing Ceremonies to help bring together tribes in a unified voice in partnership with agencies, researchers, and conservation groups as part of an intertribal alliance to restore bison to 6.3 million acres of tribal and public ancestral lands between the U.S. and Canada, and then also through working closely with the Rocky Mountain Tribal Leaders Council, who represents the tribes and all Indigenous peoples of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. So 40 years of hard work and dedication has gotten us to an incredibly exciting place with our bison work. And right now, there's just so much opportunity, momentum, and support for the ecological and cultural restoration of bison to tribal and public ancestral lands. In fact, I'm sure many of you heard about the recent secretarial order from Deb Holland um, this past week committing staff and $25 million to support the restoration of bison on federal and tribal lands with a strong emphasis and priority on tribal-led bison restoration efforts and shared stewardship opportunities. And specifically, it mentions efforts to increase the transfer of bison to tribes. This is just a super exciting time. Um, you know, as we work to further expand quarantine, the transfer program, the upcoming opportunity, to increase the efficiency of the quarantine process, the monumental shift in, in how Yellowstone is going to manage its bison population, and then the forthcoming changes in policy through Yellowstone's EIS process, more bison moving out of the park and using tolerance areas, potential bison restoration on the CMR using Yellowstone bison, and then our work to expand bison on the Wind River Indian Reservation. You know, we're moving towards a future where Yellowstone bison are allowed to truly roam and migrate well beyond the park boundary where they can restore 
lost ecosystem processes across the GYE, where they can be primarily managed through tribal hunting and the transfer program, where Yellowstone bison can help restore tribal and public herds across the continent, and really a future where shipping Yellowstone bison to slaughter becomes a rare occurrence and a thing of the past. You know, but this is not just about saving Yellowstone bison. This is about helping to restore a way of life for the original people of these lands. It's, it's about reuniting native people with the buffalo. So thanks again to all of you and our generous supporters who have helped us get here. I am truly super excited for what's to come in the next 40. So before we get into questions, I just want to make sure that all of you are aware of the next two 40th anniversary webinars. Um, the next one on March 21st, um, GYC's Legacy of Grizzly Bear Conservation, and then on April 11th, um, GYC's Legacy of Stopping Mines Next to Yellowstone. And with that, we will take questions. All right, let's all give Shana a big round of applause for that thorough and amazing and inspiring presentation. And we are, we do have almost 15 minutes for questions. Uh, my polite request, if you could post your questions in the chat, I will then moderate them. And if we do run out of time for questions, Shana has generously offered to do her best to reply to your questions over email. So if we don't have time, um, She's going to drop her email in the chat. Feel free to email her a question and she will do her best to respond. But I did note there was a question from Linda about a small distribution map that showed brucellosis free bison. And she was wondering, are those being sent to Long Island, New York? Are you referring to one of the maps in the presentation? I believe so. Yeah, the question came in much earlier. Um, I have not heard them going to Long Island, New York, but I will double check on that. <laughs> All right, we will we'll do a follow up. And then there is another question about, has there ever been a known case of infection of cattle by elk? And I'm gonna assume this is by brucellosis, about brucellosis. Yes, yes. There's been um, just over 30 cases of uh, brucellosis um, confirmed infections in cattle, um, and they've all been traced back to elk in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And how many from bison, Shana, just as a reminder? <laughs> zero, big fat zero. <laughs> all right, what other questions do we have out there? Got a question coming in. If you could explain, please, how the science might support an expedited quarantine process and how short it could be. That's a great question. Um, so they have run about 600 bison now through this quarantine process. So technically that's 600 data points. And um, what they have found is that no bison have zero converted, meaning they've gone from testing negative to then turning over and testing positive after the 270 day mark. So that's about seven months um, and it's just never happened. However, as I mentioned in the, the presentation that it takes anywhere from two to four years for bison currently to go through the process based on you know, previous um, recommendations and regulations. And so um, you know, at the beginning of all of this, they really didn't know how long it was gonna take um, to ensure brucellosis free status. And so they were very conservative in their requirements and the amount of time that it would take. Um, but yeah, I, I think with this data, there, there's actually been a couple of papers published um, showing this, this, uh, this new information and making recommendations to formally reduce the quarantine time. Um, it's possible that they might even remove bulls entirely from the quarantine process because there is no way for bulls to transmit brucellosis. Um, and that's the fear is that they will um, infect another animal, but you have to abort a fetus in order to transmit the disease. And obviously bulls don't do that. So they may be removed from the process altogether, which would be incredible. Um, but, you know, and I think significantly shorten the duration for, for cows and calves to go through the process. Awesome. And know that we, uh, 
We had a lot of information on a slide about that, but it's, as Shana just explained, it's rather complex. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for asking that question. So there's another, we have a pile coming in, which is great. We have a question from Catherine. What has been the role, if any, of indigenous knowledge in advancing bison restoration and tolerance? Oh, gosh. Unfortunately, there hasn't been, you know, as far as tolerance outside of Yellowstone and those communities, there has not been enough of that, if any at all, in fact, um, which is, you know, to our, you know, to our like sort of shift and focus in the last couple of years of really trying to incorporate, you know, the indigenous perspective and traditional eco ecological knowledge and how, you know, bison and other wildlife are managed. And, you know, there's so much information there. And um, so we're really trying to like, bring tribes into the fold and learn everything that we can from them at this point, so. Question from Kate, if there's any way to restrict cattle distribution to enhance bison country? Uh, and I think you know, got some good answers for this one. <laughs> yeah, I wish, you know, that, um, you know, what we have found is the only way, the only approach to kind of go with this is through voluntary uh, grazing allotment bios and through voluntary means. Um, it's, we're not gonna get anywhere by forcing um, anyone to remove cattle off public lands and or private lands. And, um, and nor are we really interested in doing that. You know, I think we really value um, working with um, the, you know, our, our producers that live on these landscapes and, um, you know, so it, for us, it's, it's really, it worked out in the past to have voluntary grazing allotment buyouts and land lease type situations. And um, yeah, you know, it's just gonna take time and, and, and we're never gonna restore bison, you know, to the landscape like they used to be 200 years ago. Um, that's just not a reality, but I think that we can really focus on, focus on these areas where there aren't conflicts and, um, you know, federal public lands like national wildlife refuges that, you know, don't have uh, cattle grazing and, and really focus on those areas for now. Question from Sam, is there any plan to allow for spillover of bison to the east of Yellowstone National Park? And while I'm not a bison expert, I believe that may involve literally moving mountains, but Shana, I'm curious on your thoughts. Um, I guess where, where exactly east are you? referring to. Um, Sam, if you want to drop that in the chat, it may be challenging just given geography. Uh, but we'll continue down the questions. Um, questions about your thoughts on the work Ted Turner is doing on the American Prairie Reserve in regards to bison. Um, I didn't realize Ted Turner was doing work on the American oh. Prairie Reserve. Oh, sorry, not, not American Prairie Reserve, just Ted Turner's work on bison. Um, yeah, I, you know, he's, he, you know, he's got a totally different model. He's, he's got, you know, private, a lot of private land and, um, his bison, they're considered livestock, unfortunately, because they are privately owned, um, and they're fenced. And, um, I, I think it's really great. It, it is somewhat comparable to the American Prairie Reserve and that they're using private property to sort of create, you know, like a, a full ecosystem and, and in many ways, sometimes that's that's all you can do. And I greatly appreciate that, you know, that he's doing that. And, um, you know, his land outside of Yellowstone is, is tremendous. It's amazing. There's bison, there's grizzly bears, there's wolves. It's an entire ecosystem there. And I'm really glad that, you know, we have that. Um, but again, it's, it's private and it's, it's a little bit different from, you know, what we're trying to do here, which is really focus on public land restoration and, and tribal and on tribal lands as well. Then a, a question uh, about is brucellosis a red herring? And as ranchers and many, many folks around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem like to hunt elk. Um, so in the question, they don't care about brucellosis is the real complaint damage defense lines or other private property? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. You know, it's funny because um, brucellosis never really comes up anymore in our big bison meetings with the federal agencies and state agencies and everyone who is part of the IBMP. 
um, because it's we know it's pretty much a non-issue and that it was a smokescreen for a very long time. It was sort of the excuse that the livestock constituent used to you know, fight against bison on the landscape. But I think at this point, what it really comes down to, in case in point, when you look at you know, putting bison out, you know, somewhere else, you know, like on the CMR or anywhere else, really um, using absolutely disease-free bison, 100%, the, you know, they're still just as opposed to it. And the reason being is that bison represent, well, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, they compete for grass with cattle um, and they can do damage to fencing, but I would argue no more than elk and other wildlife species. Um, they can be a little bit dangerous toward, you know, to people if people are approaching them. Obviously, we've seen that in Yellowstone, but you know, they're a wild animal and people should not be approaching them. Um, but I think more than that, they represent something else. Um, and you know, a lot of people are really terrified of what bringing bison back could mean to their way of life, and they see it as really threatening, kind of their their way of life and um, and sort of the cowboy culture. So I, yeah, there's, there's a lot more to it than brucellosis at this point. And we are gonna go with the last question here. And this is from Kate, that it's her understanding that while cattle can be vaccinated, the disease brucellosis might be masked by the vaccine. Disease-free is a requirement for export. Wouldn't it be easier to isolate cattle destined for export and keep them disease-free or does politics get in the way? <laughs> yeah, I think politics always gets in the way. Um, and the other thing too is that you know, by, uh, cattle within the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they all have to be yearly vaccinated for brucellosis. But um, unfortunately, that vaccine does not work that well, <laughs> and so it's not that effective. Um, and so, and there's a lot of myriad of issues as to why that is. Um, but the short story is that brucellosis is actually on the select agent list from the Department of Defense. <laughs> And so you're not allowed to study it um, in certain situations. And so that has stopped um, researchers and scientists from, from being able to study, study it and to develop a better vaccine for cattle. And so that's something that we've actually been advocating for along with the Department of Livestock um, together. That's something that we can agree on is that it should be removed from that, from that list so that we can develop an effective cattle vaccine. Because if that could be developed, then this would not be an issue any longer. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Shana. Thank you so much for all of you joining us today. Uh, the recording of this presentation and discussion will be posted on our website within the next few business days. And until then, please check out our podcast, our blog, and those two additional webinars um, that Shana mentioned to learn more about our work. And I'm also going to drop a link in the chat on a podcast Shana recorded last fall that is about our bison work. So if you join today, I would strongly encourage you to check this podcast out as well, as it's just fantastic. And if you'd like to support this program or any of our work at GYC, please go to our website, just hit the donate button, and you can support bison and all of the other wonderful species that we work to protect. So thank you all again so much, and please give Shana one more round of applause for her presentation and her fantastic work on bison. <laughs> thank you all so much.